you were with us last summer, you might recall that we spent 16 weeks looking through the book of 1 Corinthians, and that series was, was so foundational, so inspiring, apparently, that we had a number of people come up to us afterwards and say, hey, are we going to study through the second book of Corinthians as well? Uh, and today, I provide the answer to that question. Yes, we are going to, and we are starting that study. Yeah, you can give it up for that. Yeah, we are starting that study today. Uh, and uh, it, it's going to be an exciting, exciting summer. So um, we decided to just kind of recycle the series title and treat it as a sequel. So we are calling this The Answer, Part 2, A Study of Second Corinthians. And for those who may not have been with us last summer, or maybe those of us who just need a little bit of a refresher, what were those books all about? Uh, let me quickly lay some foundational work before we get into this so that we can kind of appropriately apply everything we're going to learn uh, over the next few weeks and, and months. By the way, this is a bit of a long introduction, but I shortened the sermon for you. So, but when I pray and you're like, wow, he's just now praying, don't worry. All right. It's going to be, it's going to be all right. So the books of first and second Corinthians are actually not books. They are letters that the apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. And Corinth was a pretty major city. In fact, it was the capital of ancient Greece and a very influential and wealthy city in the Roman Empire. Uh, it was a port city uh, about halfway between Athens and Sparta. And so it acted as one of the main hubs for import and export, not just for that region, but for the whole known world. And people were constantly coming and going uh, from uh, this, this area in Greece, from Corinth, to uh, bring their goods, bring their services, and so you had a lot of people coming in for work and leaving for work, making it a very diverse culture. Uh, but in addition to it being widely recognized as a hub of wealth and influence and diversity, uh, Corinth was also one of the most progressive cities in the ancient world. Everybody knew you could go to Corinth and you could let loose a little bit. You could, you could find yourself. You could experiment with a number of things. There was no accountability in Corinth. Corinth. And so as a result, it was also a bit of a hotbed for hedonism. Uh, we're told that you could not walk through the streets of ancient Corinth without running into one of the hundreds of many temples that had been erected to various pagan gods and goddesses. And at those temples, people were not only permitted, but they were encouraged to engage in every sexual practice known to man as a form of worship to these pagan gods. And so, it's probably obvious, but Corinth was not well known for its Christian values or its high moral character. Uh, in fact, one theologian, he, he writes this. It's a phrase that was used in the Roman Empire to refer to the Corinthians. Uh, William Barclay says, the term Corinthiazomai was well known in the Roman Empire and meant literally to live like a Corinthian. But everyone really knew that it meant to be sexually out of control. Alian, the great Greek writer, tells us that if ever a Corinthian was shown upon the stage in a Greek play, he was shown drunk. Uh, another theologian writes this, the Corinthians were widely recognized as intellectually alert, materially prosperous, but morally bankrupt. Put simply, Corinth was a place where you could go to do whatever you wanted to do, be whoever you wanted to be, indulge in whatever you wanted to indulge in, and not just be tolerated, but be celebrated for it. Let me ask, does that sound like a familiar city to anybody else in the room today? <laughs> yeah, welcome to modern day Corinth, people. You are living in that city as we speak. But while many Christians would have kept their distance from a city like this because they didn't want to be polluted by the things of the world, the Apostle Paul saw this as an incredibly strategic place to plant a church. He knew that the light of the gospel shines brightest in the darkest of places, and he figured if we can plant a thriving church in Corinth, just as they export goods to the rest of the world, the gospel can be exported from this place. And it has the ability to affect far beyond the regions of Corinth itself. So in AD 49, he comes and he plants this church and hundreds of people begin to get saved and God begins to turn that city upside down. Little side note, by the way, that is why we are sitting in this room. That is why we planted a church in this city because we believe that the light of the gospel shines brightest in the darkest of places. And if God can get a hold of this city, it goes far beyond this city. Come on, we're the opposite of Vegas. What happens here does not stay here. What happens in San Francisco affects far beyond the reaches of our city. And we believe that God is doing something here, as we sang about just a moment ago, that will affect far beyond our borders. Can I get a baby amen at the nine o'clock? And Paul believed the same. So he plants his church and it begins to thrive. But... You don't get to plant a church in an influential city like Corinth or San Francisco without there being some problems. I can testify. Hallelujah. <laughs> 
And Corinth had some problems. Shortly after the Apostle Paul plants this church, he leaves to go about his missionary journeys, and he gets word that the church in Corinth is kind of falling apart. Things are unraveling. Instead of them affecting the culture, the culture is working its way into the church, and many of the believers are beginning to embrace the pervasive ways of their culture, the same things they were doing, the same sexual practices they were engaged in before they ever met Christ. And so Paul brings a letter of correction, the letter that we studied last year, uh, 1 Corinthians, and he begins to address every single one of these problems in the church. But as the series title suggests, with every single problem, Paul reminds them that the answer is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. However, the first letter didn't work so well. <laughs> Turns out Paul's strongly worded email did not accomplish what he had attend, intended for it to accomplish. And people actually not only rejected the letter, but they began to eject, reject the apostle himself. They're like, we don't wanna do what Paul said. We wanna to continue to live our lives the way we wanna live our lives. And so when the letter didn't work, Paul shows up on the doorstep and he begins to rebuke the church in person in what he calls in 2 Corinthians, the painful visit. We don't get a lot of details about it, but that's it. It was a painful visit for the apostle to come and correct the church. He follows up that visit with another letter that has sadly been lost in history and we don't have it in the canon of scripture. However, we do have the follow-up to the follow-up letter AKA 2 Corinthians, where Paul now successfully not only addresses and brings correction, but brings restoration between him and this church and Jesus in Corinth. But his solution, although this is a new letter, remains the same. As we are going to see throughout these coming weeks, Paul makes it clear that new problems do not require new solutions. When it comes to the problems of faith, the answer has always been and always will be the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. So now that we have established that foundation, we got something to build upon. Let me give you a title and uh, we'll pray and we will get into the first chapter of this book of 2 Corinthians. Uh, as I've already asked a couple of times this morning, I offer you this title today. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Can I get an amen? This is gonna be a holler back kind of sermon, right? So, so, so just get ready. Uh, let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us today. Uh, Jesus, thank you for your presence. God, thank you that you are here among your people and we've experienced over the last few moments uh, the truth of your word that says if we draw near to you, you will draw near to us, that you are enthroned on the praises of your people. And God, we sense you here among us today. Um, as we come to this letter and we begin to consider and contextualize all that Paul wrote to this ancient church and apply it to our modern lives, I ask that you'd speak to us in the weeks ahead and you'd allow us to personalize each and every single one of these messages that he's communicating to the church and throughout time to us. God, would you, would you allow our minds to be transformed, our thought processes to be transformed so that we could leave this place different than when we came today we love you and we trust you. We thank you for the work you're gonna do in us in the weeks ahead. And the church said, Amen. come on, and the church said, Amen. Amen. All right. So Paul starts this letter off by giving a, a little bit of, a, of an update. It's kind of his Facebook post. He's like, here's what's been going on in my life and, and here's what I've been up to. And we discover rather quickly at the introduction of the first chapter that things have not been going well for the apostle and his missionary buddies. In fact, they've experienced some significant opposition, not just uh, spiritually, but even physically. He tells us that uh, they, have actually, they actually thought they were gonna die on their last missionary journey in, in Asia. But with all of the opposition, Paul says God has, has served as a constant source of comfort, and he says experiencing this comfort has allowed us to comfort others who find themselves in similar suffering. And you are going to see that theme repeated over and over and over again throughout this book. We're not going to touch much on it today, but, but you will see in the weeks ahead that this theme of comfort and suffering is laced all throughout the book of 2 Corinthians. However, after he gives this introduction, uh, Paul begins to go on, on a bit of a lengthy rant as he begins to address some accusations that have been leveled against him, uh, apparently because he was supposed to show up and visit this church, and he never did. 
He had told them that he was gonna stop by on the way to Macedonia, but when he heard about the state of affairs in the Corinthian church and their rejection of his letter and his apostolic authority, he decided to keep his distance from the church because he says he, he wanted to spare them yet a second painful visit. I just figure like he didn't wanna punch someone in the face and that's why he stayed away. Uh, so, so he stays away from the church, but apparently his absence has now been used as ammunition, not just against him, but against the very God that Paul preached to the Corinthian church. Uh, we pick up now in uh, verse 17 where it says this. Was I fickle, by the way, these are the words of Paul, was I fickle when I intended to do this or do I make my plans in a worldly manner so that in the same breath I say yes, yes, and nah, nah. But as surely as God is faithful, our message to you does not waver between yes and no. For Jesus Christ, the Son of God, does not waver between yes and no. He is the one whom Silas, Timothy, and I preached to you. And as God's ultimate yes, he always does what he says. For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. It is God who enables us, along with you, to stand firm for Christ. He has commissioned us and he's identified us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the first installment that guarantees everything he has promised us. Now, now a lot there to unpack, but let, let's start with the, the obvious. So apparently, the Corinthians have suggested that if Paul was unfaithful in fulfilling his promise, that perhaps the God whom Paul preach, uh, preaches of is exactly the same way. The untrustworthiness of the messenger has now compromised the trustworthiness of the message. As one theologian puts it, he says, the people of Corinth are asking, if we can't trust Paul in everyday matters, how can we trust what he tells us about God? Now, this is a really sad conclusion, but it's not an uncommon one, and I think you know that. People draw conclusions about God all the time based on the way people who follow him live their lives. This is why scripture tells us unequivocally, you need to live above reproach. You need to be people of character. You need to be Christ-like, live with holiness, live with integrity, yet your yes be yes and your no be no. It, when we don't do what we say, when our witness is weak on account of our character, it isn't just our reputation that suffers. It is, in fact, the reputation of Jesus that suffers in the process, and we could become that stumbling block or that wall keeping others from coming to Christ because of our character. That's another sermon for another day, but worth pointing out. So, 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 Paul, so Paul makes uh, this, or the people make this suggestion about Paul, and, and while that might be a common thing that people do, I think it's also a little bit unfair when you think about it. Like, let's, let's play this out for just a moment. Um, how many of you have ever been stood up before? Okay, stood up, coffee date, I'll give you a few examples. Uh, meeting, client stands you up, a date. Anyone ever been stood up by a date? Come on, you'd be bold, we're friends in here. Anyone ever stood up at the altar at your wedding? <laughs> I, I saw one hand, I won't point in that direction. May the Lord be with you. Yeah, we've all, we've all been stood up before. I was joking around with someone earlier. I'm like, our team leads, they get stood up every single weekend by volunteers. People last minute call out and say, well, I don't wanna be there anymore. They just don't show. In fact, you might notice that the front row is vacant and my wife is not with me today. It's not because we're in an argument right now. It's because we had some people stand us up and kids and I refuse to not let our kids pastor come to church and be a part of the church that she's helping build. So our kids pastor's in the back row and my wife's holding it down. If you're sitting in here and you were supposed to serve, you know who you are. But people get stood up all the time. And whether it was a date or, you know, it was your family member or your friend, I doubt the conclusion you drew at that moment was, well, I can never trust anything that person has ever said before. I, I am never gonna trust a word that comes out of that. I doubt when Jazzy opened up Planning Center this morning and saw a bunch of declines, she wasn't like, you know what? I'm not gonna trust any of those people ever again. They're all dead to me. Maybe if they've canceled five or six times, it could make sense. But, but at least the first time, like, there's going to be a little bit of grace. That's, that's a bit extreme, don't you think? Especially if that person happens to mention some things about God to completely write off everything they've ever said about God because they stood you up. That seems a bit extreme. Give me an example. So a, a couple of weeks ago, 
um, I was supposed to be on a Zoom call on Wednesday morning. Uh, I'm on a board for a friend of mine and his church is on the East Coast. And there were gonna be a bunch of pastors on this call together. And uh, so I had to put myself together a little bit more than I normally put myself together on a Wednesday. Uh, just, you know, little look into my life. Wednesdays is a study day for me. And I practice zero self-care on Wednesdays. Uh, I don't shave, I don't do my hair. I figure the more desperate I look to God, the more sorry he feels for me. And he's like, I'll give you a sermon. Look at that poor guy down there. He looks unhoused. We should give him a sermon. Lord, see me, I'm suffering for you. So, so, you know, I don't shave and I don't do my hair. Occasionally I'll put my hair up in like one of those little man buns, but most of the time I just let it go. And if you've ever seen me without my hair done, it is a sight to behold. Um, I look like Beaker from the Muppets. It, it, it's, in fact, I think there's a, a, a photograph. I can't be sure. Is there one? It's not there. Oh, it didn't work. Okay, I took a picture, but you don't get to see it. Thank you, Jesus. All right. So knowing that I was going to be seen by other humans, I'm like, I'm going to put myself together. So shave, take a shower, do my hair, put some, put some clothes on. You know, I'm, I'm looking the part. But then I sit down when the meeting is supposed to start in front of my computer screen, and I see those dreaded words, waiting for host to arrive. I'm like, and by the way, this is super early because it's East Coast, West Coast time. I would never take a meeting this early unless it was important. But there I am sitting in front of the computer screen. Five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. I'm just smiling, <laughs> waiting for the camera to turn on. You know, like, yeah, your host is here. <laughs> nothing, crickets, black screen, nothing. Turns out, there was a family emergency for the guy the night before and his assistant forgot to email all of the other pastors that were supposed to be on the call to tell us that the call had been canceled. So I got all dressed up for the ball and I had no date. I was just sitting there. Now, at that moment, my conclusion was not, I knew it, the guy's a liar. <laughs> Calls himself a Christian. <laughs> Shepherd to the sheep and he treats me like this. Stands me up. I don't trust a word that guy has ever said. Furthermore, I don't trust the God that he preaches about. My whole life is a sham. All of this is a lie because he stood me up on the Zoom call. That would be ridiculous. I would have issues if that is the conclusion that I drew. It is not only ridiculous, it's completely unfounded. There is no evidence to suggest that God is not faithful because this guy didn't show up to the meeting. And yet that is the conclusion that these Corinthians begin to draw conveniently. Well, if Paul didn't show up, then God's probably not going to show up. He's unfaithful to his promises. But, but Paul catches on to this very quickly, and he offers a very stern and a very clear response to their accusations. Look again at what he said in verse 18. He says, as surely as God is faithful, our message to you does not waver between yes and no. For Jesus Christ, the Son of God, does not waver between yes and no. He is the one whom Silas, Timothy, and I preach to you. And as God's ultimate yes, he always does what he says. For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. A resounding yes. Translation, even if I was a flake, which I'm not, God's not me. God's not a human. As it says in the book of Numbers, God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he would not tell the truth. Paul states emphatically every promise God has ever made is followed up with a resounding yes. He means what he says. And the greatest evidence Paul points to to prove this truth is the very person of Jesus Christ. He says, look no further than the fulfilled promise of Jesus to prove that God will do what he says. Not only did he fulfill every single one of the promises he made to the prophets and the people of the Old Testament, but he fulfilled every single one of the over 300 messianic promises that he made about Christ. He was born of a virgin, as God promised. He came from Bethlehem, as God promised. He lived a sinless life, as God promised. He died a criminal's death on a cross, as God promised. He's the only one in history to resurrect from their own grave, as God promised. And he now stands as the only way to salvation for the believers by faith and not by merit, as God promised. He points back to Jesus and he's like, guys, this is the greatest promise God has ever fulfilled. 
And if God has fulfilled his greatest promise, how much more capable is he of fulfilling every other one of the little promises he's made to you? If he can do that, he gives you a yes to everything else that he has said. And let us take advantage of this minor detour in the sermon to speak the same thing over our own lives for just a moment. Every single promise God has made to you is yes. Every promise of the 7,500 plus promises he makes in this book to you is yes. Yes, you can have joy in the midst of trial. Yes, you can have peace in the midst of chaos. Yes, you can have strength in weakness. Yes, you can live without shame and condemnation. Yes, regardless of your past, you can be forgiven. Yes, you can be healed. Yes, you can be restored. Yes, you can be delivered. Every single promise God has made to you in this book is yes. Furthermore, every promise he has made to you through prayer or through prophetic word is yes. If he has promised you increase, if he has promised you children, if he has promised you the return of sons and daughters that have run away from him, if he has promised you the salvation of friends and family members written on cards inside this box, if he's promised you healing or restoration in your marriage, yes, 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 yes. Every single promise God has made to you is Yes, and I'm going to keep preaching this until you start responding a little bit better. Every single thing he said about our church is yes. Yes, there is a permanent facility that God has made available to this house where we can plant our roots down and continue to grow. Yes, there will be revival as we sang about a moment ago over our city. Yes, he will turn this city upside down for the name of Jesus. This is not just something we're praying for or hoping for. It's something we're banking on because God has made us an Isaiah 62 promise. Our righteousness will shine like the dawn. Our salvation will blaze like a burning torch. This city will be known internationally as a place for a move of God and not the perversion and the wickedness and the crime and the desolation that it is right now. No longer will we be called the desolate place or the forsaken city. We will be called the city of God's delight and the bride of God. These are not just things we say from a stage to stir up some emotion in a room. These are the promises God has made to our house and to our city and every single one of them is yes I'm gonna lose my voice at 9 a.m. drink some tea between the services if I have to every single promise is yes yes but for every promise God has made, there is a contingency. Something required of us in order to see these promises come to pass. And Paul makes clear what that contingency is right after he tells us about God's yes. Look at what he says once again in 1 Corinthians, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians 1.20. He says, and so through him, the amen is spoken by God us to the glory of God. So after Paul tells us that every promise of God is yes, he says, after God gives you a yes promise, he asks something of you. The very question posed by our title today. Here's a promise. Can I get an amen? Now, to be clear, God's not like me. That should be reassuring for somebody. God's not begging for some verbal response. He's not like, come on guys, you're a little quiet at the nine o'clock service, can I get an amen? I beg for that all the time. That's not what God's asking for here. This is not some verbal affirmation to say, I hear what you're saying or I'm paying attention to the message. Also, amen is not just some casual conclusion to a prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. As if it's like the conclusion of a book or a a, a song or a movie, the end. It's not, that's not what amen means. Do you know that amen is probably one of the most powerful words that you have been given to utter as a believer because it's so much more than a word. According to the definition, it is in fact a declaration of faith. L look at what the word amen means in the original language. By the way, it's amen, not amen. 
for all the white people. Okay. <laughs> amen. 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 It means, so it is, so shall it be, so be it unto me. Can we, can we read that together? So it is, so shall it be, so be it unto me. In other words, our amen is our agreement with what God has said. Amen is how we latch our faith onto the promises of God. When we say amen, what we are saying is, I believe what you've spoken and I receive it by faith. I believe and I receive. Now, I know that that language has gotten a little bit tainted. So I know that some are like, well, that just sounds like name it and claim it, blab it and grab it, charismaniac rhetoric. And, and, I, and I get that. It's been abused for sure. But let me remind every single one of us, faith and belief is a really big deal to God. The Bible goes as far as to say that without faith, it is impossible for us to please God. Everything God has promised to you, everything that he wants to do in your life hinges on faith. Not just in this life, but even for eternity. We are saved by faith. We are justified by faith. We are made righteous by faith. We are healed by faith. We are delivered by faith. Faith is a massive deal to God. In fact, I have a little post-it note in the front of my Bible where I wrote this down and I give it to you. It's free of charge. I am receiving today what I believed for yesterday and I will receive tomorrow what I'm believing for today. Faith is a massive deal. And that's why Paul makes it clear to us in this text. He says, guys, it's not just enough that you know what God has promised. It's not enough to just read it. It's not even enough to recognize that he has fulfilled those promises to people before. You, you know that you could read through this entire book, cover to cover. You could jot down every single one of the promises in there and yet receive none of them apart from faith. It is only when we add our amen. Yes, it is. So be it. So be it unto me. Only after we add our faith to the promises do we begin to receive them. Only when we respond to the question, yes, you can get my amen. And that sounds relatively simple in concept, but it can be challenging in practice. Especially if you've been saying amen for a really, really long time. It's easy to believe the promises of God when they first come. Yes, amen, God. I, I trust that you can heal me. I trust that you're going to provide. I trust that you're going to bring the increase in the open door. But when those promises don't happen on the timeline you thought they would it can be more difficult to believe. We say it like this, the longer you wait, the harder it is to keep saying amen. And I see some heads nodding right now because you know that. Maybe you're sitting in the midst of that right now. You find yourself in a season where you are waiting for some things that God has promised to you. You're waiting for them to come to pass. He's promised you the return of that son or daughter to Christ. He's promised you the restoration of your marriage. He's promised you fertility or increase or open doors. And he's promised you a, a, a companion, a man. And you're like, where's he at? <laughs> I've scoured the city. There's no one for me. At first, there was faith. Yes, I believe. But now, weeks, months, years, decades have passed. And it's getting harder to keep saying amen. Perhaps even for some, your amen has been traded in for an a maybe or an a might. It's not that you don't believe it all anymore. It's just that delay has enabled seeds of doubt to get planted in your heart. And you're wondering if maybe you even heard God wrong to begin with. But if you find yourself in that space today, I believe the Holy Spirit would pose a question to you. It's the same question that he posed to me this last week as I wasn't just studying, but 
personalizing everything that we're going to discuss today as I considered many of the promises that God has made to me or my family, which we have not yet seen come to pass. And many of them are not on the timeline that I thought they would be on. For those in that space, I believe the Holy Spirit would ask you this in the midst of the waiting. Can I still get an amen? Even when you haven't seen it in the timeline you thought you'd see it, can you continue to say, so is it, so be it, so be it unto me? In the midst of that waiting season, can you still maintain faith because in your heart of hearts, you know the character of God, and so you say, I may not see it yet, but I know it's coming. By faith, I know it's coming. For the last couple of years, um, we have been taking our oldest daughter to school on the other side of the city. She goes to school in the Outer Mission. It's about a 15 minute drive from our house. And the way that um, the pick up and drop off area is set up at her school, it's really inconvenient. You can't stop the car, you can't park. And so you gotta kind of pull up and like push your kid out of the car to go to school and then drive off so that the other people uh, can come and pick up their kids. Um, but, but, but picking them up at the end of the day is even worse. If you do not time it perfectly so that you are on the curb when your kid happens to walk out of school, you gotta do a big old loop and you gotta come back around, which happens often for us. Uh, we leave our daughter standing there on the curb and, and then we gotta make a big circle and come back around and get her. And, and this is apparently a little frustrating for her because we have a, a very common conversation. Literally every time this happens, this is how it goes. Uh, the phone rings, and we see her beautiful little smiling junior high face on the caller ID. And then I'll pick up the phone. Hey, Ellie, where are you at? <laughs> How about hi, Dad? <laughs> hi, where are you at? <laughs> Kid you not, that's a conversation every single time. And for the record, we have never forgotten our kid at school, all right? <laughs> there has never been a day where we have had to be reminded that we have a daughter on the other side of the city attending school that needs to be picked up. Our track record is flawless in this regard, which is kind of a big deal because I know that some of you have actually forgotten you had a kid at school before. <laughs> I've heard your stories. You're like, oh, that's right, I have a child. I gotta go get them. Oh, man. Not I. I am blameless in this regard. I have never forgotten my child at school. And yet, despite our flawless track record, when we are not, where she wants us to be, when she wants us to be there, we are met with the, all the sass of a junior high girl. Where are you at? And every single time this happens, I have the exact same response. When I hear the frustration from my kid's voice on the other side of the phone because I'm not sitting in front of the school when she comes out, this is what I say to her every single time. Chill out. Just wait. I'll be there. Chill out, just wait, I'll be there. That's a word of God for somebody in the room today. <laughs> Chill out, just wait, I'll be there. But God, it's been a decade. Chill out, just wait, I'll be there. To every disgruntled child of God sitting on the curb waiting for your father to show up and bring the promise that he's made to you, he would speak over you today. Chill out. Just wait. I will be there. As Paul said a moment ago, I will say again, God has never failed to fulfill a single one of his promises, and he is not going to start with you, honey. You will not be the first kid that he leaves out on the curb in the spirit and goes, oh, that's right. I made a promise to them. No, he's God. If he said it, he will do it. It may not be on the timeline you want him to do it, but he is faithful. Every single promise he's made to you is yes. Your job is not to get angry or frustrated or begin to question and doubt whether he's capable, your job is to plant your feet on that curb, to plant your feet on the promises of God and keep saying amen, 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 amen. So be it, so it is, so shall it be unto me. That is our job. 
He's faithful, period. Every promise is yes. And even if the writings of Paul and my flawless parenting do not inspire you today, (laughs) even if you still feel after all of that shouting that the amen has been knocked out of you and you got nothing left to wait on, here's the good news. Paul concludes this little section by reminding us that the same God who made the promise to you in the first place is the God that will continue to wait with you until that promise comes to pass. Look at the final scripture today as the worship team comes and we prepare to conclude. But he says this in verse 21 and 22. It is God who enables us along with you to stand firm in Christ. And how does he do this? By placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the first installment which guarantees everything else that he's promised to us. Listen closely, this is such a big deal. Paul has just done what he did for 16 chapters in the first letter and what he will do for the 13 chapters of this letter. He's brought us back to the gospel, the centrality of it all. He's saying, for every problem, including the problem of yet fulfilled promises, the answer is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. How? Because the gospel conveys the greatest promise that God has ever made to you, the promise of Jesus. Not just the promise of Jesus, but the fact that Jesus has made a way for you to enter into eternity with him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, Here comes the promise that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but they will have everlasting life. And as proof of that promise, he has placed his spirit on the inside of us to remind us that eternity is coming, to remind us of the promise. He he uses this language. He says that the Holy Spirit has been given to you as a guarantee if we want to use our own language for it, it would be down payment or deposit. In the same way that you might put a deposit down on a house or the deposit down on a car, Paul is saying God has given you a deposit, proof that there is more to come and that proof is living on the inside of you. He is reminding you this life ain't it, this season ain't it, Even if you're suffering right now, it does not end with the suffering that you're walking through. There is an eternity that is still coming. And when you recognize the promise of eternity, you know what you can do? You can stand for another minute. You can stand for another hour. You can stand for another day, another week, another month, another year, another decade on that curb while you wait for the promises of God in this life because the greatest promise has already been fulfilled on the inside to which the church says, Amen. Amen.